All right, our first speaker today is Dr. Hallie Jungers. Uh, she is the current Aquatic Animal Health Fellow at UC Davis, where she has had the privilege to work in many different facets of aquatic medicine, including public aquaria, aquaculture, and research. When she isn't working, she can be found basking in the sun at the beach, swing dancing, or snuggling her two cats, Gumby and Pixie. So go ahead and take it away, Hallie. Awesome. Thanks, everyone, and thanks for coming. Um, yeah, I'm uh, Haley Jungers. I'm the UC Davis Aquatic Animal Health Fellow, and uh, I had the privilege to jump on a unique study this year um, looking at ceftazidime and signal crayfish. I'm using two different routes of administration. I would first start off by uh, thanking all of my co-authors. It was such a huge team effort. I couldn't have done this without them. Um, doctors Nitch, Henderson, Soto, Kroll, and Dunker, as well as everyone in the animal health lab, um, both Taylors, Ava, Zaynab, too, and Isabella. So huge thanks to all of them. And uh, with that, I will jump in if my computer will let me. All right. So just a bit of background, um, crayfish are in the order Decapoda. It includes the crayfish themselves, the lobsters, shrimp, and crabs. They have five pairs of thoracic appendages that are called periopods. And based on the diversity of behaviors that they can exhibit, they're considered one of the most advanced of the crustacean groups. They can live in either salt or fresh water and they grow by molting. They also have circulatory system that contains hemolymph. And um, just a bit of a caveat, uh, I'm going to say intravascular in this presentation. It might be more appropriate to think of it um, as intrahemolymph when we're talking about the, um, the injections or the results. Um, but just for simplicity's sake, we're going to stick with intravascular for today. So crustaceans themselves are gaining a bit of traction um, in public aquaria as well as the pet trade. So when we search in ZIMS, which is a database for the zoos and aquariums, when we search for all living crustaceans, we get a return of about 500 animals, and that's just the institutions that use the software. So we suspect that there's actually uh, much more than that that are being held um, in captivity under human care. And certain crustaceans like Japanese spider crabs are getting their own care manuals and their studies to kind of look at their normal parameters. And so they're definitely gaining a bit of traction as well um, as the crayfish as pets. So there's definitely been an increase in crayfish ownership that's being seen. And if you ever want to own one, there are reportedly over 130 species that are available for pets. Um, and certain ones like the one pictured here uh, definitely have some aesthetic appeal. But our case inspiration for this study actually came from a California spiny lobster named Ladybug. She was an adult female that originally presented for not eating very well. So she would get fed and then kind of intake her food, but would just end up spitting it out. And so her initial workup involved an exam where we found this, um, this mouth ulcer that you can see pictured here in the, um, in the top photo. So that kind of darker um, region amongst all the white um, was her ulcer. And then she also had these um, darker shell lesions um, like in the bottom photo that were just kind of soft and friable and obviously not the color that her shell should be. So she was originally treated with ceftazidime injections in her tail, in the tail musculature. And the plan was to further sedate her and kind of debride those lesions. And um, after three injections of ketamine to anesthetize her, um, those were unsuccessful and those were given in her tail as well. And so this kind of left us with a lot of questions. Um, one of them being, why didn't the sedation work? Should we have gone a different route of administration? And if the IM sedation didn't work, was the IM antibiotic working? So ceftazidine being given IM, was that even appropriate for her? Um, have there been any studies done with this drug? And moreover, if we have to again in the future, you know, how can we anesthetize or if need be euthanize an animal like this? And something that did cross our mind when we saw her was vibriosis. So vibrio is a gram-negative ubiquitous bacteria that's found in a lot of um, diseases. So generalized shell disease or tail necrosis in crustaceans, generalized bacterial infections. 
It's also been implicated in acute hepatopancreatic necrosis disease, um, which is a reportable disease of mainly shrimp and prawns, um, where certain vibrio species, um, parahemolyticus is one of them. There's a few others that have um, these plasmids that encode for specific toxins. But that being said, just because a crustacean has Vibrio, it doesn't mean they're all going to be pathogenic and or reportable. So there's a few of them that are listed here that, um, again, doesn't just because they have them, it doesn't mean they're reportable, but they, they can cause some lesions. And the antibiotic that we used for ladybug, again, was ceftazidime. So this is a third generation cephalosporin that kills bacteria by prohibiting the synthesis of their cell wall. And it's got a pretty broad spectrum of activity, um, so gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria. It's fairly popular in reptiles, actually, um, and in fish, it has um, a dose for using it every 72 hours. So um, for that reason, I think um, it's, it's seen on the shelves at Aquaria, but there's actually no veterinary product specifically labeled for, for our use. So, you know, dogs, cats, livestock, things like aquaculture, it's, it's not approved for any animals and especially animals that are destined for a, anywhere in the food chain or for human consumption. It's kind of a, a bigger gun antibiotic, if we will. And it has been looked at in other species, including some marine mammals, some melasma branks, fish and amphibians. And based on all of those studies, the half-life is really variable. So ranges include just over half an hour to 35 hours. So that kind of further led us to, to think, you know, what, you know, what, what, what are we, what, what are we, um, should we be doing as far as maybe dosing or something like that? And so we wanted to investigate what the pharmacokinetics were um, using IV and IM after a single dose in signal crayfish as our model. So our crayfish were wild caught. Our inclusion criteria for our study were no shell lesions responsive to um, being handled and stimuli and having all their appendages intact. Um, the crayfish in this photo have nail polish dots as identifiers. So those are not, um, those were not shell lesions. We did that for our purposes but they were housed at the Center for Aquatic Biology and Aquaculture at UC Davis in freshwater closed systems. Their filter was uh, seeded with ammonia prior to arrival and it was cycled for about six weeks. They did get supplemental air um, and the water was heated to about 20 to 22 degrees Celsius. And they were fed Hikari crab cuisine, rapidly sinking pellets. Um, just a side note, these guys are excellent escape artists. So we actually ended up having to um, to put some bricks on top of their lids because they were climbing up the pipes and um, very interested in, um, in exploring everywhere. So if you ever house them, I would recommend putting something on top. Our experimental design, um, each of our groups had six animals per group. And so we had negative controls that didn't receive any injections. So they were placed in their tank and allowed to just be. Um, we had positive controls that either received sterile water either by IV injection or IM injection. And then we had the rest of our groups that were treated with ceftazidime at 22 milligrams per kilogram and either um, again, injected IV or IM. And then after those injections, they were um, sampled at various time points and all of our controls were sampled at 240 hours. Where we injected them, um, we did use manual restraint. So they were not anesthetized um, for the uh, antibiotic injections or for um, our hemolymph collection. But I do recommend sturdy gloves. They do get a little bit feisty. Um, for our intravascular injections, we used um, this thin kind of uh, membrane here um, at the joint between the maris and the carpus. And then for our intramuscular injections, we used the tail musculature um, between the third and fourth pleopod, which are these smaller swimming legs here. Um, and we used the left side for administration just for consistency purposes, but someone could have easily done this study and used the right side. We collected the hemolymph from the ventral tail vasculature. We collected about 0.1 mils um, at minimum, but on average, we ended up about 1% of their body weight being collected, um, about 0.3 to 0.4 mils. 
and we placed the hemolymph in lithium heparin tubes and stored them at minus 80 degrees until our analysis. And after we collected the hemolymph, we did perform humane euthanasia and sampling. So for our euthanasia, we did a first initial injection with propofol at 100 milligrams per kilogram intra-abdominally. Um, there was a kind of a preliminary report that looked at this drug with um, a different species of crayfish by immersion and one by um, injection. So we decided to give it a whack and it worked really great for us. Um, and about 15 minutes after that injection, we did a second one of potassium chloride at two milliequivalents per kilogram into the thorax and confirmed death by no response to any stimuli, no movement. Um, and we proceeded to perform a necropsy to collect the hepatopancreas. This is a video showing that uh, the injection of propofol, um, it does kind of leak in this left photo. Sometimes it leaks out of where you're injecting it. But what's a little bit nice about this drug is that it's kind of a milky white color. So you can actually see it um, going in and what it will do, it, there's a connection between the, um, the abdomen and the thorax. So it's actually, um, it gets in there and it kind of bathes all of the um, internal organs. So. That's just a video depicting that. And then on the right hand photo here, this was the potassium chloride injection. So that was given at kind of the base of this, um, this second walking leg. To sample our hepatopancreas, we did perform a necropsy using a dorsal approach. So when you enter the cavity, you'll see um, the gonads. This is a photo on the left, um, these gray, black, speckled uh, structures are the ovaries. Um, if they were testes, it would kind of look white and stringy and worm-like for lack of better uh, description. Um, but when you remove the gonads, you end up with this photo on the right. So the hepatopancreas is this yellow tan kind of lobulated um, structure underneath here. And again, we sampled from the left side just for consistency. And we stored the hepatopancreas samples in a 10% neutral buffered formalin. For our hemolymph, uh, we used a PK analysis um, using liquid chromatography with tandem mass spectrometry to determine our concentrations using non-compartmental analysis of a sparse data set. And what we found from that, uh, we were able to determine the uh, maximum concentration in the hemolymph. For um, the IM group, it's reported as Cmax. And because this is an extra vascular parameter, technically, we can't report an IV um, concentration for that. So what we report is this, um, this C0. So conceptually they're, they're the same, um, but technically just reporting them a little bit differently. Um, but the time to reach that maximum concentration was really fast in the intramuscular group. So about five minutes. And we're assuming um, a time of zero for that IV group, because if you're intravascular, once you give it, we're assuming um, it's it's there. So again, reported a time of zero for that. Um, the half lives were about ten and eight hours, um, so about two hours of difference. Um, with a good bioavailability, though. Um, again, for IV, we're assuming once we give it, it's in there, so we report one hundred percent. But the IM group had about eighty percent bioavailability, um, so I think that's that's pretty good. Um, and it was last observed in the hemolymph at five days and three days, uh, respectively, for the IV and IM groups. And therapeutic levels of this drug, based on the, um, the laboratory standards, are four micrograms per milliliter. And so those, um, those therapeutic levels were last seen at two days for the IV group and about one day for the IM group. So something to consider if, um, if you're thinking about Vibrio or, or shell disease and um, you wanna make a treatment plan. Moving on to our histology. Um, so this is not a photo of mine, um, but this is a transverse section of the hepatopancreas and it has a few different functions. So whether that's to absorb some nutrients or help with digestion or produce some fats or maybe a little bit of endocrine function. Um, I think we're, we're still trying to hammer that, um, hammer that down a little bit uh, physiologically, um, but that's um, kind of the goal of the hepatopancreas and that's why we, um, why we chose to sample that for, um, um, for this uh, histology. 
So this is a photo of a normal hepatopancreas from, from one of our groups, um, from our positive control um, IV injection group. Um, but what we did find in a lot of ours actually were these encapsulations. So they're kind of the invertebrate um, equivalent of a granuloma. Um, they have this pink to uh, lighter, sometimes yellow coloration in the middle um, with the hemocytes in the periphery to kind of wall off any um, any foreign pathogens like yeast or fungus or something like that. And um, it was reported um, in one paper that about 10 micrometers was the, um, the pathogen size that they, they see these encapsulations with. Um, but I guess what's interesting is that we did have a wild population of crayfish. And so based on what we saw in our inclusion criteria, we thought they were pretty healthy. Um, could they have had some subclinical infection of something Yes, probably, um, or have been previously infected, and this was just, you know, a result, a result of that, and they're, you know, they were still doing fine. Yeah, um, and none of our crayfish, um, we didn't have any mortalities throughout our studies, so, um, so that was some good news for us. And this is just another, um, another picture from one of the other treatment groups of uh, one of the encapsulations that's staining a little bit lighter. Um, and these encapsulations were found in all of our controls and treatments, except for the two hour and 168 hour groups. So not quite sure why those groups um, didn't have it, but um, it was found in a lot of, a lot of our uh, samples. Something else that we found on one of the lesions was a dilated tubule. Um, so we don't really quite know the significance of this at this time, um, but it was present in one of the sections for our five minute um, intramuscular injection. The last lesion that our, uh, we saw for our histopath um, were these kind of big swollen nuclei. Uh, it was determined as a, to be a degenerative change by our uh, pathologist. It was found in only uh, two time points, so two hours and 120 hours. There have been similar changes, that being these swollen nuclei in um, reports of bacilliform virus, but when they have that virus, um, usually they have also eosinophilic inclusions, and we didn't see any of those inclusions in our, um, in our sections. And this is just a photo, um, not mine, but of those, what those inclusions might look like. So they're kind of in um, epithelial cells. They're, um, they're kind of pink staining. Sometimes with those um, bacilliform viruses, the, uh, the lumen, um, you'll see some sloughing. Um, the virus isn't necessarily detrimental to the host from what I understand, um, but it is very host specific. So there's a lot of um, these bacilliform viruses that are for, you know, Pasifasticus lenniusculus specifically, and there's a lot of them. Um, the exception for these viruses being detrimental is the Australian red clawed crayfish, where it did cause uh, mortalities, but usually you don't really see clinical signs um, of, of these viruses. So what did we learn? Uh, we learned that ceftazidine reaches maximum concentration pretty quickly when you give it IM. Um, for crustaceans, you could certainly consider an IV route. Um, it does technically have a longer half-life. To me, I think this was a bit counterintuitive at first um, because I thought it would have had a shorter half-life because, hey, it's already in the system, so it's going to get cleared quicker. Um, but it might have had a longer half-life if there was more drug that needed to be cleared because the concentration was a bit higher. Um, and if you're a clinician, it might be negligible because if you can't do an IV injection, um, safely, or you, know, you don't have enough hands, then you might have to do it IM, but that's still a good option because it's pretty bioavailable. We didn't have any mortalities, um, so those were, those were some good things. Where can we go from here? Um, maybe look and see if there can be a determined toxic dose of this drug, um, but I definitely would love to explore um, propofol for anesthesia and euthanasia, uh, maybe get a grading scale or some sort of consistent protocol, um, seeing kind of how well it worked. Um, I would love to, to see this incorporated into, um, into invertebrate medicine. Um, again, I think aquaculture and population health wise, this might be a little tricky, um, but this was more aimed toward, you know, individual, um, individual medicine for, um, for our crustacean friends. So, that being said, 
I would love again to just acknowledge everybody that that helped with this, uh, Dr. Soto, Nitch, and Henderson, everyone at the Aquatic Animal Health Lab, and at Cabo who helped me take care of these little critters, the Steinhardt Aquarium in San Francisco, as well as uh, this fellowship and our uh, teaching hospital. And with that, I will leave you with some references. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to take them or um, you can email me as well. Thanks, Hallie. That was a great talk. Um, yeah, we do have several minutes for questions. So if anyone has any, um, go ahead and unmute yourself and go ahead and ask, or you can drop them in the chat box and we can read them off. I have a question. Hi, Hallie. Um, hey, I'm wondering if the chemo lymph um, withdrawal was fatal um, and how often um, was it obtained? Can you say that again? I'm so sorry. I was wondering um, if the chemo lymph withdrawal was fatal to the uh, crayfish and then also if uh, or how often was it uh, obtained? Gotcha. Um, so the hemolymph, um, we actually did, before we kind of did this study, we did a little kind of mini trial run, if you will. Um, and so we actually collected um, more than 1% of the body weight um, and then kind of um, saw how they were doing the next day um, at Steinhardt Aquarium and they were, they were good. Um, so this, for our study purposes, we euthanized them kind of right after we collected it. Um, but based on what we saw, um, it wouldn't have been terminal um, if they were if they were not euthanized. Um, and for the um, the sampling, we only used one one animal once. So um, we basically had six those six animals, say for the five minute IM group, um, each animal got hemolymph drawn just once. So one hemolymph draw was one sample, if that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? We have a few more minutes still. Haley, do you rather work with crayfish or with uh, regular fish, with koi? <laughs> what, what was that? Do I regularly work with crayfish? No. No, do you rather work with crayfish or with would koi? I, would I rather? <laughs> um, well, the koi pinched me less, so. <laughs> I will say though, they they have uh, the crayfish will forever have a special place in my heart because of this. <laughs> All right, thank you, Haley. Yeah, of course, thank you.